This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I am welcoming the gorgeous, the talented, the hilarious Kim Hopkins. Kim uh, played the uh, Universal Studios wardrobe girl in Cheech and Chong's next movie, which is my favorite out of all the Cheech and Chong movies. And uh, she was also in The Hollywood Nights, The Happy Hooker Goes to Washington, and she does stand-up comedy, and she's very funny. And we're going to be talking about all that stuff today, and I can't wait. She was also a Johnny Carson, Mighty Arts Carson player as well. And it's going to be a great conversation. We've been trying to do this since 420, and we've had to reschedule a few times, but today we're going to make it happen, and I can't wait. It's going to be a fun, fun conversation even with all the crazy shit going on in the world, fucking the whole thing with Trump today, and then, you know, the writer's strike going on, you know, we gotta be entertained, we gotta have some fun, and not take things seriously, you know, I hope I'm providing some escapism for people who listen to this show, you know, with all the fucked up problems of the world. So yeah, here is my interview with Kim Hopkins. Hey, Kim. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I am doing awesome today. How are you? <laughs> I am spectacular. I'm so glad we could finally make this happen. So thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, my gosh. My pleasure. My honor. <laughs> so going back in time, I know that uh, you started modeling when you were, like, what, three years old? I think I was a little younger than that. But yeah, about that. <laughs> yeah. Was your mama model, too? My mom, I think she did a little bit of modeling, but that she wasn't really a model. No, nope. I was discovered on the subway by Bert Stern. Wow, that's pretty wow. prestige. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was kind of cool for a kid. I loved it. Yeah, so like, what, like, what did you start modeling in, like catalogs and all that? No, actually, the first thing I did was a cover. Um, the cover from a calls magazine, <clears throat> excuse me, and two pages inside mm-hmm. for fashion. Yeah, that was the very first thing, and they did a whole um, promotional thing because it was the, the biggest issue they ever did, and it was um, Christmas issue. Mm-hmm. So they had full page ads in all the papers, and it was on. It was everywhere, like everywhere. As a little kid, seeing yourself plastered on the newsstands in New York and in the subways everywhere. It was crazy. Yeah, great. That is pretty crazy. Yeah. Like, uh, um, your father, George Hopkins, was a comedian. Um, was was he like a uh, cat skills Borscht Belt kind of guy? Yeah, he was in the beginning. Um, and then he moved on to Vegas. And then at the end of his life, he was doing the cruise ships and... He lived in Miami, so he was in clubs in Miami and playing the drums at church. Wow, playing the drums at church. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> were, were, were you a funny kid? Um, I think I was a quirky kid and kind of precocious, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't say funny. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think I was funny then, no. No, it's something you, you, you developed as you got older? Yeah, I, I guess because I am kind of quirky. I never, the modeling thing was just, I was blessed genetically, um, mm-hmm. but I never really took it very seriously. Like I didn't take myself seriously. So the outside didn't mean that much to me. And I was always kind of pursuing something more. And I never knew what it was till I got into my forties, but um it wasn't really funny. I guess I was quirky. People found me funny, but I didn't think I was funny. I didn't start doing stand-up till I was, I think, 50. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And my mother actually bought me a group on to go to a class. And I went to the first class, and I was like, "This, I don't do stand-up. I just don't do stand-up. And the girls, just get up and, you know, tell stories. And I didn't. Everybody was cracking up. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm funny then. And I never went back to the class, and I just did the Laugh Factory. It was the first thing I ever did. I wrote it the night before and got up in front of everyone and did it. 
I invited like everybody that I knew in the business, producers, directors, casting directors, there was like 40 people that I knew there, and I almost chickened out. <laughs> 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 yeah well, well we'll get to the comedy slowly but like what age did you start gravitating toward acting um well when i was like six i think it was i was cast in um 40 pounds of trouble with tony curtis but they we started filming yeah. actually but then they couldn't get me to cry. They tried the, what happened if your mommy didn't come back? And I said, my mom's right there. And I was like, I wasn't going to cry, so I got fired, which was kind of a drag. I kept that script on my suitcase. I taped it to the outside of my suitcase when I was a little girl till I don't know how old I was. But that was when I started. Um, didn't really pursue it until I was about 20. Uh-huh. And it was, it was just a fluke thing. Um, the Hollywood Nights... They uh, called my modeling agency, I guess, to book actresses, and I went to the audition with Floyd Mutrix yeah. at, I think it was the Zephyr Theater, and I went in, he said, can you act? And I said, yeah. I wasn't really sure, but <laughs> I always said yes to everything. So yeah, I did the audition, and I booked the role in Hollywood Nights. Wow, and so, like, what year did you get to L.A.? Oh, um, I think I was in third grade, so I was just a little one. Oh, okay, so you you had been there most of your life already. Yeah, where are you? I uh, currently I'm in Modesto, California, but I'm born and raised in San Francisco. Oh, nice. I like San Francisco. I like Modesto too, but yeah, it's it's pretty interesting over here in Modesto. I've been here only a couple of weeks, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm born and raised in San Francisco. It's not the same place it was when I was growing up, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Yeah, lots of capitalism in Silicon Valley taking it over, sadly. Um, oh. Yeah, so, like, yeah, you studied with Milton Caselis at the Beverly Hills Playhouse? Yes, I did. Well, I was really... Oh, gosh, I can't think of his name right now. It wasn't no. I studied with Milton a little bit, but I also studied with someone else there, and I can't think of his name right now. It's what? been a long time. I really didn't do well in classes. I because I didn't I didn't like doing the same scene over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. I was really I memorized things almost immediately. If I read through something three times, I got it. So <clears throat> I didn't like doing scene work for months. Um, so I really didn't stay in any class for longer than a month at most. Yeah. Well, he, you, you weren't there long enough for him to indoctrinate you into Scientology, right? Oh, hell no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I actually, I think it's funny because I did take a couple of Scientology classes, courses, whatever they call them. Yeah. Like the first two. And if you... Google my name in Scientology, it shows you because they have that for all the world to see. So yes, I went to two of those things and those kooky people, I mean, it's not kooky, they're really crazy and it's awful, but um, that's my opinion. I know, I agree. I know, I, I've interviewed a bunch of them, you know, the ones that have actually given me their time because a lot of them, you know, they hear science fiction at the beginning of my show and they take offense by that. But then, you know, because they think that I'm going to, like, you know, um, I'm going to ask them gotcha questions, you know, but I'm not going to. I don't care about Scientology. I just want to talk about their work, you know. But the ones who have that come on air and stuff, they're such nice people, you know. And it's just like, God, why do they got to be in that cult, you know? <laughs> Well, did you watch the um, the show that uh, Lisa Rimini did? Leah Rimini, yeah. Yeah, Leah. Um, yeah, it, it devast I mean, I was devastated by what they actually do. I had no idea it was that bad. But, yeah, I mean, I think vulnerable, gullible, naive people go into it with one thing in mind, and then they get indoctrinated, and they just become a part of the cult. It's really sad. It's really, really creepy, yeah, and God, I just I uh, just hope it comes to a head someday. I really do. Um, so you, uh, you were at you were at the uh, you studied at the Groundlings with Gary Austin. Yeah, I I went to the Groundlings for a short period of time, but then I studied privately with Gary and his wife Wendy. Mm -hmm. With 
Gary was an amazing man. I was hoping to do a one-woman show with him, but he passed away before we could do that. Oh. But just learning from him, you know, I went to his private, you know, his private classes, not at the Groundlings later. Um, I guess I, I want to say it was like 10 years ago or 12 years ago. And uh, then I went to Wendy's classes, but that was so much more than going to the, the actual Groundlings because it was just not the same thing. And I, I also didn't like the way the Groundlings did the classes. Like, you had to start at the very beginning, no matter if you were really good or not. You know, they said that they would go through a process with you and see where you fit, but they always made everybody start at the beginning. So it was kind of like, I don't want to spend $400 a month yeah. to get to the next step. I'm already writing my own stuff. I've already been touring with a group, you know, an improv group. So I just didn't have it in me to do it. I, I, it's great for new people, though. Yeah, I've become friends and interviewed a lot of the the early groundlings, and they're they're just such great people, and they're so humble about it too. Because back then there was no room for there was plenty of room for error. There was no there was no worrying about making money. They just did it for like you know no money and very low attendance, and they just honed their craft. And then when the when the uh, money came in, you know they they kept doing it, and some of them went on to great careers. Yeah, no, I mean, and it's a great, I think yeah, any any time you, well, it's a business in the end, you know, I mean, so you have to do certain things, but I think that, you know, anything should be for all people. I mean, obviously, the very beginners have to be out in, a, in a different group than people who are more advanced, but I like to have everybody together because I teach a class for acting and I have people who have never done anything and who have really heavy accents to people who've worked, you know, I mean, I, I work with Abigail Breslin, who's my friend, Abby, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she'll call me and say, I have a big audition, can you coach me? I'm like, yeah, sure. I mean, so I know the difference, but I felt like with Groundlings, it was like, we're going to put you in this group, and then we're going to move you into this group, and then we're going to move you into this group, and it was like, not really, it, it felt more like a business than an actual um, group, which it was in the beginning. Yeah. I, and I think that's what I loved about Gary, because his class was for everyone. You know, everyone at every level was in there, and you learned more from being with the people who were really good at what they did. So, yeah. The yeah. The are awesome. Yeah, so many of them, God, they were just so talented and could have been anything. You know, but you know, the, there's the lucky ones like Pee Wee Herman and Elvira and Phil Hartman and all of them. Yeah, it's fantastic. And Sandy Stotzer. <laughs> Who? Sandy. Oh, I'm sorry. Sandy Helberg. Sandy Helberg, yeah. I've had him yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what? What did I just say? That word just it came out. What? Um, yeah, Sandy Helberg, who I still am in touch with. Love him. He's hysterical. Oh, yeah. On Hollywood Night, I was breaking up when he and, uh, oh, my brain is not functioning today. Um, <laughs> Oh, I can't think of his name, the big guy in Hollywood Nights. Anyway, oh, Stuart, Stuart, Pan Stuart Pankin. I'm, who? Stuart Pankin. No, no, not Stuart. Stuart, I died. I got kicked off the set when he was doing one of the scenes in the parking lot. Because oh, yeah? I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I could not not laugh. I, it just wasn't happening. And I still remind him of that all the time. I've run into Stuart several times. We are Facebook friends. But I ran into him, um... At a, uh, a retirement home, or yeah, and mm -hmm. he was, you know, doing a little show there. He's so sweet. He's just an angel. Oh, yeah. Um, I've talked to five people from the Hollywood Nights. I've talked to Stuart Sandy, uh, Art LaFleur, who's no longer with us, and uh, Joyce Heiser. And, oh, Joyce. I love her. And who else? Uh, just those four, and you're the fifth. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, oh, those those are all wonderful people, and yeah, yeah from what I gather, it, it was a lot of fun, right? Oh, it was crazy. It was wild. When we were shooting afternoon to like, you know, four in the morning, most of our stuff, and so it was. We were all a little loopy by the end of it. It, it was a great set. It was tons of fun. Tony Danza, I mean, Robert Wall. Yeah. We're still friends. Joey Kamen. <laughs> Joey Kamen. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. It was it, everybody. It was uh, you know who I do see a lot is um, Nazi Dreyer. Oh yeah. He's a sweetheart. He's a love bug. I just adore him. He was just little. He was like twelve, I think, when we did it. Yeah, I, I haven't had him on yet, but yeah, he, he's pretty good. Also, uh, Mike Binder was there, uh, Gaylord Sartain, Richard Shaw. There's a lot of great Gaylord. names. That's who I was going to say, Gaylord Sartain. He was amazing. And it's Moosey, not Mousey. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> told you, told you. I'm a little loopy today. Um, yeah, Gaylord was the one. Gaylord and Sandy together in... The bathroom when they went in the bathroom and they were doing that whole thing and they came yeah. out and they were sliding around in the trash. Oh my God, I almost died. But they were just hysterical together. Yeah, Stewart told me that he was in a movie theater many years later and Michelle Pfeiffer snuck up on him and and gave him a great big hug because she hadn't seen him since that movie. <laughs> oh wow, that's nice. That's so sweet. Yeah, I had Michelle's uh, sister, Dee Dee, on here last year, and uh, she's launching a podcast. Hopefully, I'm going to be on it, uh, she said, because it's about, um, it's about um, you know, uh, you know uh, sobriety and stuff. Her and I r- related to that, so we shall see. But yeah, Floyd Mutrix, I, don't, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Sandy who told me Floyd was, like, drunk throughout this movie, and it's a miracle it got finished. <laughs> And I will eventually, I, I mean, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, there was a bottle of vodka in my trailer every single night. Like, they were giving out booze. Like, everyone was getting drunk on that. Said it wasn't just Floyd. I don't drink. So mm-hmm. I wasn't drinking. But, yeah, it, it was a, I actually had a horrible experience on that set. You know all these t- all these teen comedies in the eighties. There was always partying going on because they're all twenty year old casts, and they're just they're just they're just doing inappropriate things the whole time. And some of them will fess up to it, and some of them won't. <laughs> like like in yeah. my experience talking to them, yeah. <laughs> well, if I if I was a drinker, I probably would have been drinking the whole time. But I wasn't a drinker back then. I was more likely to be doing cocaine but I wasn't I didn't ever do drugs when I was working I still yeah. well, I don't do drugs anymore at all and I That's still good. don't drink every once in a while I'll have tequila I love tequila but I don't drink very yeah. much um, but I actually was assaulted on that set um, oh I'm sorry yeah yeah no it was pretty bad actually I mean I don't take I don't carry things with me because life is too short and that's just the way I've always been but it was a pretty scary experience. I woke up, so somebody on the set offered to give me a ride home because my keys disappeared out of my dressing room. Uh-huh. And I woke up in a hotel um, in the morning. I had obviously been drugged. I was given some, like a soda or something before we left oh. by this person. And I woke up and my clothes were torn in areas they shouldn't have been. And yeah, uh, yeah it was pretty bad. My mother bought me a brass, um, one of those big brass keychains with a whistle on it. Uh-huh. And so she said, I want you to keep this with you. And I said, I will. I never, I don't, I did tell Tony Danza and Tony Danza did, you know, speak to him, but I didn't do really much else because I, you know, back then it was, you were always kind of afraid to say anything. So I didn't say anything to Floyd or to the Screen Actors Guild. I should have. Danza would kick that guy's ass, I'll tell you. Yeah. Oh, my God. That that That's so awful. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Well, like I said, I was drugged, so I don't remember it. I just remember, you know, waking up and going, oh, geez. I mean, he was there. He was sitting in a chair across the room, and it was just sort of the unspoken, just don't say anything. And I was like, okay, I'm going to... Home and deal with this because I have to be back on the set. <laughs> so just like, it was, you know, it was, it, it was so much, but I didn't remember any of it. So I guess it was easy for me to not really put a lot into it or make a lot of it. But I did mention it to Tony. Oh, God. That is awful. I'm so sorry. Next you do The Happy Hooker Goes to Hollywood, and I I read that you refused to get naked in this movie. I 
did refuse to get it. Well, I turned it down uh -huh. originally because, one, I had read the script, and two, Adam West, was like my Batman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was at first excited, but then when I read it, I was like, geez, no, I don't want to think of him this way. And I didn't really want to be a part of it. So I turned it down. And then I got a phone call one day and they said, welcome aboard. And I went, welcome aboard. What? And they said, happy hooker goes Hollywood. And I went, oh, no, I'm not. I'm not. And they, oh, no, yeah, we, um, we're going to use you for young Xavier. And I went, Oh, okay. And I went to wardrobe, and uh, the wardrobe girl created this, you know, like this sheer, which ended up in the film, a sheer um, top. It was really, it was actually a really cute costume. Yeah. And we started to do the scene, and the director was like, okay, you know, you're going to take off your top. I said, no, I am not taking off my top. Well, the set got shut down, and he yelled at me that I was never going to work in this town again, and that... Uh, you know, oh, Derek had done it, and I was like, oh, Derek's not really an actress, and yeah. he said, you know, Julie, Julie Andrews did it, and I said, yeah, that was her husband directing, I said, no, I'm not, you know, I wasn't an idiot, I, I mean, and a lot of the girls back then that they got to take off their tops were not, they were very naive. Mm -hmm. And they felt pressure to do it. And I didn't. I just said, no, thank you. And they basically were going to fire me. And then they came over. This happened to me twice. It happened to me on Hollywood Nights also. Um, he said, no, okay, fine, we'll do it that way. So they just did it the way they did it. You can still see my nipples. You know, I wasn't oh, yeah. afraid to be naked. I just didn't want to be that girl that was naked in every film. You know, a small part here and naked. So, yeah, that was sort of frustrating. But it actually, it ended up being a very cute bit part. Yeah, oh, and, you know, I, I have no complaint about that, that nipple top. It was enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I reached out to the real Happy Hooker um, last month because during the month of May I do sex podcasts and I and I didn't get a response back. You know, I can always try again next year. Hopefully she'll still be alive because she's like in her 80s now. But um, did you work with uh, Lisa London? I, you know, I don't think so. On that film? Yeah. No, I really, it was me and that old guy. And they shot it in um, right right at the very beginning of Marina Del Rey on Venice Boulevard, there's that church over there. I don't know if you know it at all, but um, we shot upstairs in there in a room and it was just the girls that were behind me and the older guy teacher and that was it. It was just a real quick thing. So I, I wasn't on set very long. It was one day. Right. Yeah, Chris Lemon was in it, um, uh, Martine Beswick, uh, Edie Adams from It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Yeah, that was a, that was a pretty good cast there. Oh, and there was also uh, Phil Silvers and Richard Deacon, legends there. <laughs> yeah, no, there was, I mean, I, who knew that I was going to end up in three cult classics? I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm a huge fan of Cheech and Chong, and I had Tommy on here a few years ago, which was just surreal for me. And, yeah, uh, Cheech and Chong's next movie is my favorite out of all his, out of all their movies. Like, how did you get cast in it? Oh, boy, this is a fun story. <laughs> <laughs> this one, I knew I was going to be topless. So I went to the audition, and I had this red dress that had a very, very deep V. And I could just, I, my thing for going to, like, castings for, not castings, interviews for modeling when you had to be naked, mm -hmm. I didn't do any nude modeling. Well, I did do some nude modeling, but the nude modeling that I did was, like, you know, you'd be laying there naked, but you were on your stomach so they could see your back kind of thing. Uh -huh. But I knew how to go into those rooms and not have them, like, ogle. So I'd go in, and I would take off whatever I needed to take off right there so they couldn't, <laughs> like, <laughs> when you walk in the room and you're naked or you come out and come back in, it's kind of an awkward feeling. Mm -hmm. So I went into the room with, and I think there were probably, like, 10 or 12 people, because I know that Howard Brown was there, Cheech was there, um, Tommy was there, Pam Basker, Fern Champion, the casting directors. There was like maybe 10, 12 people in the room. 
And I walked in with this dress on, and they started talking and asking me questions, and they said, but can we see your breasts? And I said, yeah, and I just dropped down the top of my dress because mm. it tied at the waist. And they all just kind of went, oh, okay. Um, and then I, they said, you can put your top back on. So I pulled up the, the shoulders, uh-huh. and the one on the left wouldn't cover my breast. It kept coming down off. I was like, well, this one has a mind of its own. I can't, sorry. <laughs> and Cheech almost fell off of the couch. He was laughing so hard. And I was like, oh, I hope I didn't screw that up. But evidently I didn't. Um, I did not end up naked in the film. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, like, where, where are you naked at in there? <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, it, <laughs> um, I worked, we did shoot the scene, and I have yeah. it on a three-quarter inch tape, yeah. but nobody seems to be able to transfer it. Um, it just, Tommy's direct, I love Tommy as a director. He was like the best director. He was so much fun to work with. It was a great set to be on. Um, it, it was fun. Mm-hmm. But they came to me the second day and they said, here's your wardrobe. And it was a pair of underwear. And I said, no, 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 my wardrobe is the whole thing. Like, you know, I didn't know I was just going to be in a pair of underwear on a bed with Cheech. That was kind of not what I was planning on. Yeah. Now I look back and he was freaking hot back then. <laughs> he was in great shape. He, I don't know what I was thinking, but anyway, oh, he was married. That's why. Um, yeah. But I, I went. We went down to the um, back lot uh, at Universal, and they had this big, you know, sound stage, and there was a big bed in there. And Tommy said, "Okay, I want you to get on the bed with Cheech, and then make every move a Playboy centerfold." Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Oh well, I could do that." And so I started doing it, and it just, um, I, I think, I, I was rusty, and I think it just didn't work. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I was never told why, but they didn't put it in the film, so that was fine with me. Yeah, I, I really rem- didn't want to have it out there anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, um, yeah, the, uh, the, yeah, you were the, uh, uh, the costume girl at Universal on set, yeah, I remember taking a tour of Universal like ten years later, and it was still the same. It, it still looked the same, uh, the studio, yeah. and like, yeah. So like, yeah, I know Cheech new, needs new clothes before work. You know, he tells you that he they rescued a burning baby, and yeah. then, then he wanted to make out with you. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was funny. He was really funny. I think I love that he called me by my real name. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was kind of fun. Yeah. I was like, oh, he's going to call me Kim. That's great. Okay, I'll take that. Why, was there another name in the script? Um, yeah, there was, actually. Huh. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, and of course, uh, all the groundlings were there. John Paragon was the director. Uh, Rita Wilson and, and Elvira are, like, being kidnapped on that set. And... Uh, Tracy Newman, who's been on the show, was there too. Yeah, all the all the old groundlings, you know. And then of course, Jake Steinfeld is the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> yes, uh, Gary Austin was in that scene too. He's in, in the second row where the director is, and yeah. he's got the big glasses on. That's Gary. Yeah. That is that is really cool. That is Gary Austin. Yeah, yeah. It's just so great. That's always been my favorite one. Just. The way uh, Tommy just, you know, he's, he's he, he, you know, he smokes that dead roach and then won't stop coughing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he 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 kills the neighbor's um, flowers. Roses. Oh my god, that was so funny. When I saw it, I was dying. It was so funny. Um, Jake and I actually got to be friends. Um, uh-huh. We both were um, let go for various reasons, um, uh-huh. but. Uh, <laughs> Jake and I got to be friends after that, and I actually did his first workout video, Whoa. Body by Jake, on the beach in Malibu with a bunch of other people. But yeah, that was, I made friends on all the set, so it was kind of cool. I mean, I'm, I'm still friends with Gary Graham, kind of, on Facebook, and um, yeah, I made friends on all those sets and pretty much have stayed in touch with the people who I worked with the most. Yeah, you know, Jake made his first uh, his first movie. He was a, he was a horror villain. It was called Home Sweet Home. Oh, it was like around that same time. Oh my God, he's so psychotically scary in that movie. 
Really? I have to watch that now. That'd it's, be it, so cool. It's on YouTube. Check it out. And I, I've interviewed the director, and I interviewed an actor from it. Oh, okay. I'll definitely check it out. Fun. Yeah. I'm looking for something good to watch. So, how did you get to be a Mighty Art Carson player? Um, that was my modeling agent, Judith Fontaine, sent mm-hmm. me for an audition. Back then, it was kind of like a fuzzy world with, you know, acting agents and modeling agents. And if they wanted somebody attractive, they would call the modeling agencies, I think. So, I got an audition and went, and Johnny liked me, so... He used me as one of his Mighty Carson Art players. And so I got to do a bunch of stuff with him and on the show. It was fun. Was it uh, during the time Carol Wayne and Teresa Genzel were on? Um, probably, yeah. Yeah, because they were the uh, Art Fern girls. Yeah. Tea time with Art yep. Fern. Gosh, that's so long ago. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> I know. I just interviewed Shelley Herman, who was a uh, NBC page in in the in oh, the wow. mid seventies. She has a book out about it that just came out, and just talked about how magical it was to be at the Tonight Show during that time because Johnny was the man. He was number one. You know, uh, Letterman hadn't become the, the other king of late night yet. It was just Johnny, and it was just it was just a magical time. You know. But it really was. It was, and it, the sh- just being on the show. I actually dated um, Bruce Grayson, who is now. Well, he was always a fantastic makeup artist. He was my makeup artist on the show, mm-hmm. and we started dating. We were together, for, I think, a little over a year. Yeah. Um, and he <laughs> he made things fun too. Um, I got to meet uh, Vincent Price because Bruce wow. was working on Hollywood. Or the, what was it, the Hollywood... Hollywood Wax Ho- Museum? No, 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 it was the Hollywood... I, it was something, the Hollywood... Squares? Hollywood Squares. Oh, the game it show. Hollywood Squares, and Vincent Price was on. I had Vincent Price's cookbook. I love to cook. I mean, yeah. I love to cook, and I had Vincent Price's cookbook when I was like 20 or 21, and he said, you're never going to believe who's in my chair right now. You need to come here. <laughs> and so I went there, and I had the book with me, and Vincent Price turned around, and he said, oh, you have beautiful blue eyes, and I couldn't even talk. I mean, and trust me, I'm not that person. I, I'm really comfortable with anybody. Yeah. But I was so, I had been watching his scary movies since I was a little girl, and I was just like so starstruck. The only time in my life that I was ever starstruck. And he autographed my book, and he told me that his favorite recipe in his book was calves liver and avocado, which I never made, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've had his daughter Victoria on here twice. She's just wonderful, and I've met her in person. Great lady, and she's keeping his memory alive. Like she does, like uh, Q and A's for like movie screenings of his and stuff, and the the horror conventions and stuff. Just a wonderful lady. That's wonderful to hear. I like that. Yeah. So you you were in the uh, Family Feud sketch. I was in the Family Feud sketch with Richard Dawson. Yeah. I played Coot Stark. <laughs> yeah, and he's Reagan. Uh, Johnny is Reagan, and he asks him, "Name something you find on a farm." Well, is it a well? It is. You have one family feud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really fun. I did um, the parting of the arches, McDonald's, um, and he was Moses. It was pretty funny. Yeah, it was fun working with him. Um, when, I, I don't know. George Burns pinched my rear end backstage before I went out. I felt somebody grab my butt, and I was like, who? and I turned around, I, and he just was standing there. And I was like, oh, he I have a big old grin on his face. Like, okay. I have never heard that about George Burns. You're the first one. Oh, it was kind of, it was, yeah, I will never forget that. <laughs> oh, God, one of my favorite stories. Okay, he, he was doing Oh, God, You Devil. And this, yeah. this comedian I interviewed, Danny Mora, was in it. And uh, they're filming the scene at the hotel in Florida. And some confusion happened on the set. And the whole cast and crew that was there had to leave for a while, right? So George Burns is sitting on this very uncomfortable hotel chair. 
and he literally had to wait two hours and stuff because he just, you know, didn't want to be a part of that confusion. So then they come back, and George Burns says, it's about time you all came back. I've been sitting on my dick for two hours. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That's, ah, that's funny. I was cracking up. Yeah, how long were you there at the Tonight Show? Oh, a couple of years. Um, I got to know the director really well, and so I just kept, they kept bringing me back. Bobby Quinn? Yeah, Bobby. I love Bobby. And, uh, with us. Fred, yeah. De, Fred de, Cor de Cordova uh, was the producer, and... Yep. Uh, Jim McCauley booked all the comedians. Yeah, I never met him. Um, but I, because of that, I had got an audition with Dick Clark mm -hmm. for bloopers and practical jokes. Oh, and yes. I went in and he booked me. I went in and I met him and he booked me right there. And I did that show. That was a fun story. That, that was funny. This is a funny story. <laughs> okay, <laughs> tell me the blooper story. <laughs> So they had me bring my own dress. They said, bring an evening gown. So I brought, because I was the blooper, the golden blooper girl. So um, I was giving the award for the show. And um, I brought this gown that was, it had rhinestone straps, and it went very low in the back. And it, it just kind of crossed over, but the back was like almost to your, like the curve yeah. of your back. So yeah. really low. And there was really nowhere to put a mic. So they put it on the inside by my thigh under my dress because it also had a huge slit. So it was like there wasn't a lot of places and it was very tight. Mm -hmm. Well, you can see it online. Um, and when I was backstage when they were putting it on me, I didn't know that it was hot. And I said, what is this, some kind of a French tickler? Yeah. <laughs> and the whole audience heard it. And I was like, I could hear them laughing. And I was like, oh, my God. So when I went out, I was already like, <laughs> Because when he said, and now our golden blooper girl, Miss Kim Hopkins, and I was like, great. French tickler, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was Dick Clark like? Because I heard that he could have a temper backstage. Um, no, I didn't. I mean, he was extremely pleasant with me. I have, I can't say a bad word about him. I didn't see him ever be any anything but a gentleman. That's good. But Johnny had a temper. <laughs> Who? Johnny Carson had a temper. Oh yeah, I yeah. heard. I heard he was very quiet, reserved. But oh my God, if you pissed him off, oh he would let you know it. <laughs> oh well, you know this is a funny story, and I'm sure Howie Mandel is, <laughs> will remember this. Yep. He put a whoopee cushion in, on Johnny's makeup chair. Yeah. And I think it, it it definitely did not go over well. I mean, I was just <laughs> walking by and I heard him get really really angry he wanted to know who did it and I was like oh whoever that was I don't know what happened uh -huh. but he was pissed off oh my god um, yeah I was like I'm gonna go hide now cause that's not me and I don't want to even be caught <laughs> no yeah so yeah I saw it Oh, if Fred or somebody did it, he wouldn't mind. But Howie, oh my God! <laughs> yeah, I don't know how. I don't. I don't know what happened, but I'm sure. I don't even know if he ever found out that it was Howie that did it. I don't know. I mean, he banned Howie for bringing that big old. Uh, what was it? It was like a big old foot or something he brought from the stage or something. Yeah. Yeah. Howie oh. didn't know. I mean, you know, he, my dad actually got thrown off of a couple of shows. I mean, uh, Jack Parr. Was, well, my uh -huh. dad was a, a very big advocate for the black people. Yeah. Um, he, and he, I guess Jack Parr said the N-word, and my dad went ballistic. Yes. And so Jack Parr had him banned from the show. Um, Awful. Yeah, I mean, I think comedians sometimes don't know their boundaries that they can cross and you know whether it's being funny or being you know supportive of another group or whatever you, you have to really know where your place is yeah oh god that's terrible so you, you did you take a long break from acting because you were you were tired of you know uh, being asked to take your top off <laughs> yeah i did several times 
um, because I am a very strong actress, and I'm really good with comedy, but I'm also a very good dramatic actress, and it seems like, even, I mean, I always kept thinking, maybe when I'm 30, and I would come back to work, and it was, you know, 30, you still look like you're 20, and then 40, I thought, well, maybe 40, and then 50, I thought, well, maybe 50, and then 60, I was like, oh, maybe 60, no, but they, uh, I think it, I was about 54, and they wanted me for this role, and I auditioned for it. It was a very um, intense, dramatic role about this woman who was, she was a theater director mm-hmm. and owner, and her son worked with her, and her son dies. Uh-huh. And so she starts having an affair with the young man who is um, in charge of, I, I don't remember what it was exactly, but he was in the theater all the time, and he was mm-hmm. about the same age as her son. And the story was really great, but at one point, he said, well, we want you to be naked in this scene. And I said, are you kidding me? Like, really? You oh, don't God. want to see me naked anymore. I mean, I don't think I was that bad, but I didn't want to do a movie. And my son was, you know, 20-something years old, and I just didn't feel, it seemed gratuitous to me. And I said, well, well, we'll make the glass, you know, frosted. And, we'll and I said, no, I'm not, no, I'm sorry, no, I'm not going to do it. So, yeah, I kept leaving. And coming back and leaving and coming back. And finally now, I think I've been working more in the last five, six years than I ever have. But um, and I think people are more respectful now also. Yeah. I mean, I know there's a lot of nudity and unnecessary nudity. And there's a lot of talk about it. Like, I mean, there's a couple of shows that people have brought up to me, like Euphoria. Young girls saying, well, I don't think it's fair that that girl always has to be naked. But she wants to... If somebody agrees to do it, yeah. then they have to do it. You don't have to take the role. And I, I, the actors that I work with, I tell them, you have to decide before you even get an agent what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do because it's not fair to production to go to an audition, book a job, and then say, yeah, you know what, I won't do that. Whether it's, you know, nudity or vulgarity or something to do with religion or rape, whatever it is, mm-hmm. When you make the commitment to do it, you have to do it. I will not do full nudity. I mean, I I had a breast reduction two years ago, so now I've got scars, so I don't think they want to see my boobs anymore. (laughs) 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 So, um, yeah, so when, when when you first went up to do stand up comedy, were you nervous? Oh, my God. The very first time, I told you, I had just written it the night before. I was at the Laugh Factory. I was upstairs with the bartender, and I was pacing, and he said, you're going to be great. I can just tell. You're gonna, and I was like, oh, my God, how can you tell? You can't tell. It could be awful. He's like, no, no, I, I could just, I have a feeling about you that you're going to be great. And I was like, oh, my God. And I they said, you're going to be on next. And I started to come down the stairs. I was like, almost going to leave. <laughs> I almost left because I was like, what am I doing? This is crazy. <laughs> but I went out there and I did it and I got a great response. Um, it probably wasn't my best comedy ever, but it was good enough to make people laugh and it felt great. I, mean, I wasn't nervous once I started. Mm-hmm. I think it just kind of came naturally. I mean, you know, when you're an actor, you're an actor. And just, oh, I'm a comedian right now, so I'm just going to do what I wrote. And I did and it felt great, and then after that, I wasn't nervous. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Jimmy Masada, you know, a lot of people are critical of him, but, like, he lets people over 50 on stage at the Laugh Factory, and I think that's great. Yeah, no, he's awesome. He actually, when my father passed away, my stepmother wanted me to do a fundraiser because um, they had spent a lot of their money for his care towards the end, and she asked me to do that and I contacted him and I asked him if we could do a fundraiser there and he said yes you let me know the comedians that you want to bring in and I'll ask other comedians that we have you know on our list and you know I contacted a lot of people but in the end I didn't do it because it just didn't feel right to me to do that for my he, she, I don't think she really needed the money so I think it was just sort of her and I don't know it just we didn't do it but he was complete he's like yes of course he was such a lovely person I mean he is such a lovely person but it was so lovely of him to say yes um so I really appreciate him for everything I just I mean everything yeah did you hang out at the comedy store in the 80s um no I did not 
did not. I didn't hang out at comedy clubs. I mean, I, I was hanging out in comedy clubs from, you know, a baby until, you know, whenever. Because my dad was, my dad and my stepdad were both comedians, so I yeah. was in enough comedy clubs when I was little. But I, I'm a really hard critic of comics, so, like, I'll, I don't find a lot of people really funny. I mean... My, my sense, I did stand up for 10 years in San Francisco. My sense of humor is very body and very politically incorrect, you know. And that's not a great place to do that kind of humor. And it, it, it took me 10 years to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, the desk, though, is there like a big comedy club? Um, it's mostly alternative uh, venues, you know, um, the, 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 the coffee houses and the... Um, the um, uh, you know, little underground organic, you know, open mics uh, uh, places. Basically, it's it, you know we have a couple comedy clubs in San Francisco, and and uh, some in the East Bay. You know, but it's it, it, I mean it's part. There's a comedy boom that's been happening for the last decade. That just you know it took a while to come back again because you know, comedy was in a weird place after the '90s. You know, uh, the oversaturation of comedy in the, by the early '90s just really made it um, sink and then the uh, the alternative boom like took off for a little bit but it wasn't like mainstream of success now it's kind of mainstream I think yeah I, I don't know I, I think one of the things that for me that kept me from doing a lot of stand up comedy was I felt like it's like the coffee shop on the corner here. It was, you know, it was always busy, but it was busy with people buying coffee. There'd be a line, then people would disappear. There'd be another line, people would disappear. And now there's all these people hanging out in there on their laptops because somebody said you can network here and you can get discovered here. You're not going to get discovered at a coffee shop, guys. I'm really sorry. I hate to tell you that, but it's not going to happen. Um, but. Uh, in the comedy club thing, it was like all these people who were like, the only way to get a TV show and the only way to get into comedy acting is to do stand-up and then you'll get your own show. And then I was like, oh my God, there were so many people, oh, yeah. players and doctors and everybody was doing it. I was like, you guys are not funny. <laughs> there were guys, there were guys who were actors who were using the stand-up stage to, as a backdoor to get into stand-up. There were guys... Like, uh, there were guys like, you know, John Kassir, who I've interviewed, love, love him, great guy. There was, there was, um, you know, uh, Rick Podell, who, it, who was like a, who was like a Milton Casella student. He was like New York trained and then he was getting into stand up, and then that led to him writing for comedy. Haven't interviewed him yet, but I'm going to reach out to him. There were guys like that who were just getting into stand up just so they could be seen for acting, you know, and they succeeded. Michael Keaton did it. Uh, yeah. God, so many people. Yeah, well, that was before this one, this, this little thing that I'm talking about. It was like 2010, yeah. something around there. Yeah. It was like everybody was like doing it. I, was, I mean, even people that I was seeing like three, four years ago that were not really even actors yet, and they weren't funny at all. They weren't good at acting, but they decided to go take comedy classes because they wanted to get, do comedy to get into TV. And I was like, oh, my God, that's not... Okay, go for it. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm going to advise against it, but go for it if you want to. <laughs> I, I wanted the whole enchilada. I wanted. I love Saturday Night Live. I wanted. I wanted to go to the Groundlings after high school, but you know, life got in the way, unfortunately. But I wanted to um, give that a go as well, you know. But I never. I never got to take an improv class. Tommy, it's never too late. It's Let not. Me just tell you that. I'm, I, I just told you I'm working more now than I ever have. I'm getting more respect than I ever have. I I started directing about six years ago. Mm -hmm. um, all of the things that I've done, have, I've won over a little bit over a hundred awards now for directing and acting um, in my own projects. So it's never too late to do anything. I know. I'm just, I'm just saying. I never got to, but it, it's on the plan at some point in the future. You know, we'll we'll see where it takes me. There's nothing over here really for like improv comedy, but we'll see. Something will come my way. But yeah, so so, so this year you're, you're, you've written and directed shorts, right? Yeah, I've written and directed shorts, micro shorts, and also a pilot with Abigail Breslin called Animals, which is a dark comedy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. 
<laughs> nice. Yeah, the, the shorts are the shorts are really popular now. They're getting seen more. They're showing up on YouTube and Vimeo, and they're winning awards at festivals. It, it's crazy. I never thought I'd, I'd I'd see the day. Yeah, neither did I, and I never thought I would ever enter into a festival. The first film that I did is a very dark psychological thriller um, short, and it's uh, called Animals. And Johnny Ray Diaz, I can't, oh my God, I love Johnny Ray. He's on a new show called Primo. It's one of the most hysterical comedies. It's on freebie. You need to watch it. Okay. If you want to interview him, I will definitely put you in touch with him. Um, he is just an angel, but he came and auditioned for Animals, and I was like, I forgot to hit record because he was so good. He was just so good, and I, um, I loved the way it came out, and I entered it into festivals, and I swept the first, fe the Hollywood Blood Horror Festival. I got every single award, like every single award. I think I got 10 awards for that. And um, then with Cannibals, um, we start, I started entering it in January, and we've won 62 awards so far. Best Acting Duo for oh. Abigail and I. Um, best director for Abby and I, um, best dark comedy, best comedy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, just, it's one best ensemble cast, best production, best production value. I mean, just everything. We just keep winning. So, pretty exciting. Oh, congrats! That that is so yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, like, do do you get a um, a satisfaction teaching that you don't get when you're performing? Um, I don't know. I, I, I get a lot of satisfaction teaching because I love to help people and I love to see them get work and I love to see them um, change, you know, to grow in their work. And uh, this last week, um, I had I did an audition thing where I had everyone come and do it, come to class was something that I had sent them to do as an audition and everyone did it and uh, I was kind of a little bit not happy about it. I was yeah. like, what have I been teaching you guys? <laughs> like, have you been listening at all? Yeah. So I, I gave them each an hour of my time for free to come and work with me privately and then go back and next, because class is on Monday night, so next week we're going to retape everything. But I gave them an hour this week and worked with them and taped them, and it was like 100% better than the first time. So I know that next week it's going to be 200%. So for me, it's gratifying. I, I just, I, I love it, and I love when I when I get a phone call and they say, do you have somebody who could do a role like this? And I go, yes, and they get mm. it. it. It's, I mean, I don't think there's anything better. It's brings me so much joy and so yeah I mean and I can do it while I'm working I mean it doesn't I, I can be working although now with the writer strike and the SAG yeah. like pen, impending strike you know it's, it's a little frustrating but it just gives me more time to spend with the actors that I'm working with and yes I do I, I love it I love teaching Oh, I'm so happy. Yeah, I mean, I've I've talked to so many people who are like teaching now and stuff, and I can tell the ones who are really passionate and the ones that are just doing it for the money and they're almost running a, a cult-like aspect of, you know, of, of 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 teaching acting. You know, going back to that Scientology thing earlier. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and that's the thing. So my class, I only charge two hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. and so there's four Mondays and a Saturday, and on the Saturday we shoot a real scene for them like so that they have they can pull tape for their reel and I also if they need to do a self tape I do it for them for free I don't charge them for that and I always have snacks last night I ordered pizza I mean I just for me it's it's really about helping people and I get these emails all the time from these other acting coaches or teachers or whatever they call themselves mm -hmm. you know three hundred just this week for my three-part thing and I'm like you're going to charge somebody $397 to teach them something online like it's a pre-recorded to me it's just everybody's trying to make money off actors and most of them don't have the money yeah so I, for me it's heartbreaking you know and also I, I wonder where I mean some most of these people have you know they do extra work or I don't know I just it, boggles my mind and that they have so many people buying into it 
you know, and like I make sure that my agents, my agents, my actors get agents and that they get, this month I'm having um, some of my friends, Johnny Ray Diaz is going to zoom into my class on the 19th and, you know, tell my actors how he got into the business and, you know, what his career path has been and give them some advice. And then uh, Jordan Brady, who's a really big commercial director and a friend of mine, is going to zoom in on the 26th and talk to them. And then in um, July, with Karshan Budkar, I'm sure you know who he is. He's very, very funny. He's on the show Ghost. And he was in Pitch Perfect. Mm-hmm. He was just, he gave away awards at the Tonys. I mean, he, he and I have been friends for about 10 years. We met in a comedy writing class. And he's got three beautiful children. He's an amazing guy. And he's going to um, zoom in to speak to them in July. So nice. I really do, you know, like I, I try to give them as much information as I can and bring in people, directors, casting directors, actors who are working right now. you got to watch Primo and Ghost. They're both really great shows. But Johnny Ray Diaz is hysterical. Nice, nice. I'll check them out, I promise. So we... uh, you too, and if you don't get back to me and tell me that you don't love those shows, they're both the best shows. Not because <laughs> they're my friends on there, but because they're really good. I don't, I don't watch shows that I don't like. Even if it's a friend, I don't do it. Yeah, but I know how it is. <laughs> yeah. So we got Play My Secret Silly Game. This is a series of silly slumber party questions. No win or lose, just pure fun. And how the game works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me that exact same question and I answer it. And feel free to comment on answers because they might be funny. Okay. <laughs> Kim, are you ticklish? Not yet. I'm very, very, very ticklish, and I'm not going to tell you where. Okay. So, Tommy, are you ticklish? Oh, yes. If you tickle me without warning, I might hit you in the groin. <laughs> That's terrible. That would hurt a lot. Yeah. I'm telling you ever. <laughs> Is your belly button an innie or an outie? It is an innie, but I just had... Um, surgery for my gallbladder and my kidney, so now it's kind uh, of a an inny with a flat top. Yeah, I know what that. I know what that's like. I have one too. I had my gallbladder out seven years ago. Oh no! Yeah, that's, that's painful. That's painful. That is really painful. Gallbladder. It is painful. And they say you'll be fine the next day. It took me six weeks to recover. Okay, is your nor button an inny or an outie? It's an inny. And it's flat. Flat, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in Does it get lint in it? Uh, occasionally, not as much as it used to. But, um, like, I showed it to somebody recently, and she's like, ooh, it's smiling at me. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, what color are your toenails painted? Right now, they're very sparkly periwinkle blue. Nice. Uh, what color are your toenails painted? Light purple. Oh my god, we're, that's, we're like the same. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. What sign are you? What sign am I? A Gemini. Oh, we're not the same, so I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what would you say is your best personality trait? My best personality trait is that I genuinely care and listen. I can tell. You do. <laughs> You're sweet. Okay, what is your best personality trait? I have empathy and I have no filter. Well, those are both really good things. Well, sometimes they don't filter because I don't have a filter either and sometimes I get some, some trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Oh, permanent solution at the beauty salon. Ugh. It's so gross. It's just... I don't even, I don't even know what that smell, you just, it's gross, disgusting. Is there a stinky smell that makes you want to peek? Either farts or feet. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, now I have to tell you a really horrible story. Okay, okay. Oh my god. Okay, this is the lie, I promise, I won't go on forever. So, I used to do massage, I might do it again because of the strike, I mean, you gotta make money. Yeah. Um, (laughs) There was this woman that I went to see, and she was she had me come to her.
her office at 7 o'clock at night where she worked, and she had this huge office, and I put her on the table. She said, oh, could you do me a favor? Could you run and get me my purse out of my desk drawer in the other office and also get me there's a bottle of uh, champagne in the refrigerator, and I thought, okay, weird. So I give it to her. She pours herself a glass of champagne, and then she goes in there with a big bag of pills, and she takes a couple. I didn't know what they were at the time. Now I do. They were um, Vicodin. Um, and she lays down, and she was kind of a, you know those kind of short, round people? Like, they're, they, they're just short. They look like like a peg. I don't know how to explain it. I get it. <laughs> Barely, she's a, she was just a little barrel, is what she was. And so mm. I was working on her back, and then I got to her legs, and I was trying to work her legs. She said, can you hand me that bag and another glass of champagne? I said, sure. So she took another pill and did it. And as I'm working on her, all of a sudden I hear this, big <laughs> and I went, oh, my God. And she goes, oh, I'm sorry. I said, no, no, it's okay. It's all right. I mean, it happens. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the smell hit me and I went mm -hmm. I, mean, I literally I, I couldn't even stop myself and she said uh oh and I went mm -hmm. uh -oh. like I couldn't stop myself from gagging it was it was the most putrid smell I had ever smelled in my whole entire life I had to leave the room and she did it again and I was like I, I can't finish I'm so sorry oh my god it was it was bad. It was really bad. I, I, I used to work at a bar, and somebody in my family died. I can't remember who at this time. It was a, <laughs> it was a while ago. And uh, this guy, who was like a right-wing Republican from Boston, uh, nice guy, but a real jerk uh, when it came yeah. to politics, He he's giving me his condolences. He's like, oh, Tommy, I'm so sorry that you lost somebody. You know, I lost, you know, I lost my Aunt Martha not too long ago, right? She, I saw her take her last breath. And while he's telling me this, I almost took my last breath because I smelt the worst beer fart in the fucking world, right? And then my friend, who's the bartender, right, she comes over to him and says, hey, hey, Mark, do you, is there anything else you need? Because I want to go outside and smoke. And that whole time, I'm waiting for her to, like, smell it, and I'm laughing so freaking hard. <laughs> And then, and then um, I, I I asked her later, and she's like, "Oh no, I smelled it. I was just being nice." <laughs> oh God, I can't be nice, but but I mean, I literally couldn't control. I mean, I kept gagging. It was I knew she couldn't hear me. I mean, I was gagging. I've never had that happen before. But yep, yep, yeah, bad smells. So yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have a joke for you. Okay, I'm ready. What do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate? Um, I don't know. A liar. <laughs> <laughs> it always gets a laugh. Always. That's, that is funny. Well, Kim, I want to thank you so much for finally making this happen. I'm so happy. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm really not flaky at all. I'm, like, usually the person who's there early and stays late and goes way over what I need to do. But, you know, 90-year-old moms, they just are 90 years old and things happen. So I apologize. Absolutely, I totally get it. I'm going through stuff with my mom. She's going to be 70 next year, and she's already starting to do things that she's supposed to do a little bit later. And, you know, I guess my grandmother is haunting her, you know? Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, if you ever want to talk about that offline, just give me a call. I have a lot of knowledge on elder care. Absolutely, you know, I, I, I see becoming friends with you, you know, after this, because you, you do have such a kind heart, and I've enjoyed talking to you so much. Thank you, you too. Yes, thank you, and you have yourself a great day. Be safe out there. You too, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Kim Hopkins, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh my God, I could just, she's oozing with kindness. That's all I, that's the only way I could put it. She is a sweetheart and she is just oozing with kindness. I am so glad that we got to talk today and uh, she's a brave, brave woman and hilarious. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past. Because the present sucks. Liar, dudes. <laughs>